let's do six it. Six month, six months in Florida. Yes, and you know, um, the person that I was most worried about was not me. Was not my husband. Was our sixteen year old son ripping him out from the middle of high school to go to mm. a brand new place and. Thankfully, due to sports, it's pretty easy to make friends. So he has a tribe of lacrosse guys around him, and all is good. How, now, how did he do with his performance going into a new climate like that? He hates change. Um, many of us do. But um, no. he's moved so many times, he's kind of gotten used to it, used to being the new kid. And um, he, he was just so so good about it and he just um started making friends really from from day one and um it's just grown from there it helps that he has a girlfriend now <laughs> well then there's that <laughs> yes <laughs> well let's let's dive into it here i'm gonna put my ben franklin specs on and uh marianne martin let me read uh folks we've got marianne martin on here and and let me read a little intro Marianne's passion has always been listening and learning about people. Coming from a medical family, a uh, father and both brothers are physicians, and mom was a pharmacist, and uh, you were expected to follow suit there. So, of course, you did. You went to UCLA to study communications and become a journalist. Oh, very cool. I didn't know that about you. I, I was uh, the but black there was... sheep, Jeff. What's that now? I was the black sheep. <laughs> oh, you rebel, you. <laughs> you rebel. I, I can I can see that in all of your posts. You're such a rebel, anti everything. You're amazing. <laughs> You're amazing. I'm I'm glad you took the path you did. But then, but then it says you always had that strong pull in the medicine and uh, became an endocrinologist, uh, graduating from the University of Michigan, practicing for 17 years in Southern Cal and Las Vegas. Uh, combining that with your love of learning about people. And offering a solution, be more being becoming more preventative based, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that solution, becoming a health and wellness coach, working one on one with people to coach them to live an optimal life, physically, mentally, spiritually, and financially. And I, as you know, I can definitely attest to that. I, I just recently got married, uh, fall quarter last year, and about sixty days prior, which isn't a heck of a lot of time. You and I engaged together, and I dropped right about what was it? 21 pounds, yes. 21 pounds felt great. You know, the, every, everything kind of, um, it, and it was much more than just physical, wasn't it? It you know? was, you it really were was thinking more clearly. You had better habits. You were hydrating. I, I think a lot of, um, whatever it took to plan a wedding, keep everything together emotionally while you're preparing for a big day like that. And from what I heard and from the pictures I saw, you were a dancing machine, Jeff. Danny Terrio. If anyone knows who Danny Terrio is, dance did fever, we just, baby. Dance fever, baby. <laughs> we put Fred and Ginger to shame that night. We did. We did. Um, but, you know, I, I, a good part of our discussion here, I really want to, as you know, the Debbie Chronicles talks about pretty much everything family but it really focuses on the success of it. How do we promote it? How do we identify the challenges against it? And what, what was the catalyst that had you switch from uh, endocrinology to a more preventative path? Well, I'm going to highlight one of my favorite clients, which just demonstrates, I think, the heartbeat of the Deadbeat Chronicles. Um, so this was a person who was a construction worker in Vegas. He's um, married, four kids, and I've been seeing him. He's got type 2 diabetes. I'd been seeing him for probably three years. I talked to him about lifestyle changes. He was on five shots of insulin and multiple pills. And he said, you know what? Everything's under control with the amount of medications I'm on. I'm good. And I left it at that. So I had seen him in the fall and he said, okay, I'm ready. And I'm like, what are you ready for? And he said, I need to make a change. And I said, share with me what, what spurred this on. And as you know, in Vegas, it is incredibly hot. And he tried to take his six-year-old son to one of the water parks. And as they're both going up the ladder, when he got to the top, 
they said, I am so sorry, but you're past the weight limit and you're not going to be able to go down with your son. The look on his son's face, he said, I never want to see that disappointment in my son's eyes ever again. Hmm. That's what it took for him to take that step towards improving his health. And just by changing, not dramatically, just little changes in nutrition and hydration and sleep and how he was handling stress, he went from five shots of insulin, multiple tablets, to zero insulin. Now, this guy was on over 300 units of insulin a day. That's a lot of insulin. And on top of that, just how all those medications make you feel, very tired, bloated, and all of that, and completely turned it around. And in nine months, he was down 110 pounds. But the biggest thing that he noticed mentally was after a hard day's work, typically when he got home on the driveway, he would actually sit on the driveway for about 15 minutes and take a nap. He was exhausted. He was so tired. And he knew as soon as he went through that door, all the kids were going to be on him. And he just did not mm. have the mental space to do that. But then even when he walked in, he would just go straight up to his room and sleep until dinner. And what he noticed was as he was changing his habits, getting better sleep and really improving his health, he was looking forward to getting home and actually going outside and playing with his kids and engaging as an active dad instead of on bed or on the couch. You know, I, I've i got a, a list of questions we were kind of going over that I had made up the other day, just, you know, preparing for today. Um, very first question, how important is it for each and every one of us to have good overall self-esteem? So I really do feel like our self-esteem is a reflection of the relationships that we've had. And that could be from our parents. It could be from our best friend. It could be from a teacher. It could be from a coach. But if you don't have one relationship where you felt loved, you're not going to have good self-esteem. But it just takes one relationship. That's the beautiful thing. And you can hang on to that just from that one person who you felt love from. That's enough to give you your self-esteem. And then it's contagious. You know, when you have good self-esteem and you're around others who may not have good self-esteem, they basically borrow yours until you love them enough to show them they're worthy. And they are valuable and they have things to contribute to others. And that builds up their self-esteem. And, and I think that's got a, a lot to do with it is along that path that you're talking about in really when, when someone's self-esteem is down to really look for that one love in their past or even current life and to leverage it. But at some point that self-love, that, that turning inward and really believing in oneself and loving oneself and enjoying learning and growing and all those things. It, it's complicated. It's different for everybody, isn't it? It's it so, is. Um, you know, um, one of my other questions here, what are, when we talk about self-love, I think there's a lot of self-discipline in there, right? Whoop, didn't mean to kick my desk. Um, what are some of the distractions and excuses that you normally hear as a coach uh, about people's lack, their own admissions of lack of self-discipline and how do you, what would you recommend to turn, to write that ship and turn that back? Jeff, you know, I've heard it all. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. <laughs> and, you know, I think for many people, it starts with stress, emotional eating. It starts with, I hate to say it, I'm going to be a little harsh. It starts with blaming everybody else except taking personal responsibility. So it could be, it was a holiday. It was my spouse brought home pizza. Um, my kids wanted to go through the drive through Whatever it is, if you don't have self-discipline, we're getting to get back to this, you don't have self-love. Because if you've made promises to yourself, if you have goals that are important to you, 
and you're continuing to break them every single day, you're, you're not loving yourself. True. So in terms of turning that around, what I always ask people to do is before I even share with them what my strategy would be to turn that around, I don't tell anybody the how until they tell me the why. They got to tell me why it's important for them to make this change, why it's important for them to achieve their goal, how it's going to make them feel, how they're going to show up for others when they achieve that goal. Until they have a powerful why, it's meaningless how I can help them. I, I can give them all the steps, but they won't follow them. Right. And uh, do you see in your clients, in your relationships, because if, if look, this is your business, I, am I technically a, a client? I, I'd like to think we've had some really wonderful conversations about some different things in life, even uh, other growth things besides just plain health and, and physical health, right? So um, when you're working with your your customers, your relationships, or do you see improvement in their current relationships or and or improvement in going out into a new relationship on, on this same path that runs parallel? Oh my gosh, absolutely. So if I could describe the change in women, first of all, we're very sensitive our, about our bodies. Not that men aren't, but women are particularly very aware of certain parts of their body not looking the same anymore, especially with hormone changes, menopause, whatever it is. And when we don't feel like um, we're sexy, we're not going to be want, we don't want any intimacy. That's what a lot of women share with me. And so when they start feeling more comfortable in their own skin, they feel more energetic. They're radiating health from the inside out. They're going to be more open and intimate with their partners always. Now for men, what tends to happen is when they're not nourishing their bodies very well, they tend to be very tired. So for men, it's that they don't have the energy. They used to have a lot of muscles or they used to do a, a really good workout that made them feel vibrant. And now they have no energy to do that anymore. And um, so for men, it's more, I think, being more vigorous, more vibrant, you know, vibrant and, and having that strength back. And for women, it's the confidence and the sexy back. Yeah, no, no doubt. And and then do you and David, uh, I, I, I see you guys are active, but do you have any actual routine? Are you out on the tennis court or pickleball court or walks or hikes that's routine? Or is it kind of occasional? What are the, what are the challenges against that, if so? Well, my husband's going to kill me because he's going to say, who's David? <laughs> so it's Scott. Oh, my God. Scott, <laughs> Jesus. Oh, my God. So David, Scott. Is my face red? Is this live? <laughs> my gosh. I just wanted to we make better, sure. We're going to turn like... that into a short or real. Be like, yeah, well, David thinks I'm doing great. We don't know who David is, but Scott and I get together every now and again. <laughs> so, um, so Scott and I, we do love pickleball <laughs> together. And yeah. um, we do love snowboarding together. But there are some things that we do individually. You can't get me on a road bike. I don't like to be hunched over. He loves road biking. Um, I love playing tennis for hours and hours. He could he could do without that. So I think it's actually important to have some things that are just yours mm -hmm. and some things that you enjoy doing with your significant other. And um, I don't think that's a bad thing that I, I want to hold a couple things just just for myself and my, te my tennis girls. Yep. Yep. Or, or, or anything else. And, and I'll kind of segue into how important is, and we've touched on this a little bit, but, but how important is it running the physical routine along with a very healthy mental routine? Good. We have good diet food. How about good brain food? And then what's the routine on that food? Brain you food. know, I think in the beginning, people have to start with the nourishment and the body first. When they do start feeling better, then they can focus on their mind. And really, you can't have optimal health without both being in really 
optimal levels, physical mm -hmm. and mental. And so for sure, the best way to improve your mental health is you've got to get good quality sleep. That's, that's where it has to start. But secondly, you also have to surround yourself with positivity. You know, I, this is just me, but I don't watch the news. I'll listen to, you know, some headlines or whatever, just so I can stay current, but it's so negative. And all I need to do is just to know what's going on in my local um, community and a little bit about the national community. And that's all I need. Because if I get sucked into that negativity, not just on the news, but just even on social media, as you know, there's so much divisiveness in our country right now. I just choose not to subscribe to that. Um, so just like you, I'm a big proponent of growth and personal development. So whenever I'm doing chores, whenever I'm in the car, I'm usually listening to a podcast. And that's how I fuel my mind. Yeah. And, and with all of the distractions that are coming into all of us as individuals and married couples and everything in, in between, the, the value of time blocking, scheduling, being really dynamic with your time management, it's hard. It's mm -hmm. hard. I, I would be totally kidding anybody watching this right now if I said I was some kind of a really incredibly tight self-disciplined. I've probably, probably created a lot of situations in my life where there's so much incoming that's naturally distractive. So we, we have to watch what we create. In, in my life, I think there's been ebb and flow of created some things that got real busy, a little hectic, and then you tone it down a little bit. And then you're like, oh, okay, I can handle more. And then you jump, like, for instance, the nonprofit with Room Redux. That's one extra element of time. We love it. We've committed to it and all these things. But it's still time. So all these things coming in. So the mornings, you and I have had conversations about mornings. Waking mm -hmm. up and uh, I, I say owning the morning. You say you use the term. I'll never forget. Be intentful yes. with your mornings and talk a little bit about what's your routine, morning routine. Well, so the night before I've already prepared and I make it a habit that the night before I already know everything that's on my schedule. I take a, a quick look at it. I know which clients I'm calling. I know which coaches I need to support. I know where I need to be at what time. That doesn't mean that things can't be moved around. I, I can have some flexibility. That's the wonderful thing. But for me, it starts with I'm an early riser and thankfully nobody else in the house is. So I get about two hours of complete, you know, silence in the house. And so I will typically put on some morning motivation music, just some calm meditation. Um, I'll probably do some some reading. And actually, you've inspired me to start doing some writing, just some journaling. And um, oh, sweet. It's, yeah, That's just to great. put my thoughts down. Um, and so after that, that takes about 30 minutes and then I'll work out. I love working out in the morning. Just get it done over with. Then I, I feel refreshed and energized for the rest of the day. So what I you're going to laugh. But when our kids were very young, like you know, toddler, um, because both Scott and I were working, we dropped him off at daycare. Well, the night before, we just put him in whatever clothes they were going to wear the next day. I didn't even fuss about pajamas. Whatever they were going to wear the next day for school, that's what they went to bed in. So we literally just woke him up, put him in the car seat, out you go. <laughs> so Systems and procedures. Yeah. So the more you're prepared and the more you can make things easy for yourself and set yourself up for success, your morning's going to go so smooth. Yeah. And, and the, 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 there are far more distractions as the day goes on. For sure. Activities, yes. whatever those activities and distractions are, whether we've created them or not, you know, and then now, uh, do you have, you and I have talked a little bit about, uh, I'm a, a big fan of a guy like Ryan Holiday. I like talking to our audience about what is the good brain food out there. I've talked about Ryan Holiday and Jocko Willink and David Goggins, uh, kind of lean military a little bit, but yes. all kinds of good offers, uh, authors. Who's your favorite? So, or, or one of them? Yeah. So I'll, I'll name you three guys 
that I really, really like and one girl, just to keep it fair. <laughs> so, sure. um, so I love Ed Milet and Ryan, Ryan was on Ed's show. Um, and I love Simon Sinek, John Maxwell, and then my favorite woman is Jenna Kucher. She is amazing. Well, the, those last three names are new for me. So I'll definitely, that's the beauty of a recorded podcast, right? We can come back. I don't have to take notes right now. But <laughs> no, I'll, I'll come back, take a peek at, at definitely those names and everything. And then I know uh, we're ramping up on your next appointment and everything, but just this question, I, I think, is allowed to be a little bit long-winded and not a single answer. It might be asked like a single answer, and that's just, it, it's a marriage question. In your opinion, what's the single greatest contributor to the success of your marriage? All the moving parts included in time and kids and relocation. Well, gosh, um, had you asked me a couple of years ago, I would have said, I have no clue. Like, I, I need some help on that myself. And... I've really gone on um, sort of uh, an evolution in my emotional and spiritual state. And that has actually led me to have more understanding, not just for my husband, but really for, for everybody around me. So let me explain. Let's say that you asked a very good friend of yours who's a builder to build your home. And you already know he's going to do an amazing job because he's, he's a dear friend of yours. So he says to you, here are the keys. I'm so proud of this house that I've created for you. It's all with love. And I want you to do me a favor. If there's anything that's not right with this house, just write it down and give it to me. So you start moving in. And um, it, at first, it's like, oh, my gosh, like, he's, he's brilliant. This is amazing. I love this house. And as you live in it year after year, you start seeing some of the things that were hidden from the beginning. And you start seeing little cracks here and little holes there and things that weren't quite straight. And would you at that point go back to your dear friend and say, yeah, here, here's my list of like 20 things, you know, come fix it. You wouldn't do that. But we sometimes do that to our spouses, right? When we first met them, there were so many things that we fell in love with that we absolutely loved about them. And as we get married and we spend more time with each other and we get to know each other and see each other's faults and flaws, as well as um, the things that made us fall in love with them in the first place, are we going to focus on their superpowers or are we going to focus on their weaknesses? Knowing that as a couple, each year, you're both going to change or maybe one person changes and the other doesn't. The question is, are you going to change together or are you going to change apart? And that is an intentional decision that has to be made between both parties. And so what I found was that first I thought it was Scott that was changing, but then if you ask Scott, he thought I was changing and then we were drifting apart big time, especially in California. Um, we, we sort of got it back together again in Vegas and then stress and, and other things started becoming a distraction again, as it can easily do that. And we had to sit down with each other and intentionally make the decision to grow together and have a vision of what that life together would look like from here on out, because it's totally different than when we got married 22 years ago. And I would say, because we made the decision to do that, our marriage is a thousand times stronger today than when we first were newlyweds in all of that bliss. That bliss was great, but I was ignorantly blissful <laughs> now it's intent intently blissful <laughs> exactly <laughs> you know uh you know and and you you mentioned being sitting down and being incredibly intentful with incredible communication and uh clear clear drawn out ideas um you you, you say you need to sit down and have that intentful conversation 
I would suggest that it needs to be more intentful than ever before because all of the mechanisms in today's society, be it an awful lot of our society uh, is very divided, an awful lot of our social media, our entertainment, other parts of our society are very competitive, very critical, not supportive. Let's let's tear something down rather than build it up. Let's let's identify all the wrongs in a situation and ultra focus on that and completely ignore any other value of anything else. It could be a thing, it could be a person, system, organization, or a movement or an effort. It's all about tearing it down, isn't it? Absolutely. It's so much easier to criticize than to actually come up with a solution. That's mm -hmm. the thing is whenever you hear somebody who's just criticizing all the time, just ask them, what would you do to solve the problem? That'll get them to be quiet. Nine times out of 10. I agree. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, someone will keep blabbing on. It's like, there's an idea for you. But, <laughs> but no, I, um, as Again, I, I don't want to squeeze you in, into your very next appointment. We knew this was uh, coming, but um, Marianne, I'd love to continue the conversation. I believe that uh, reviewing something more than once is great. Reading a book more than once is great. Having the same conversation is, is great. I'm going to steal a, a phrase, and this is not Ryan Holiday's phrase. He actually uh, picked this from one of the Stoics. Uh, a man never steps in the same river twice. So our conversation, I'd, I'd love it to evolve and continue uh, talking about everything, the, the real balance and daily routine of good mental health, good mental routine, intent for routine, and good physical and diet lifestyle. I think it really matters. Uh, I, I think Looking at it from a larger message set, I do believe it would move the needle into not only healthier biological bodies, but healthier relationships that they're involved with. I do. 100%. It would be my so, pleasure. So, well, with that said, uh, tell David I said hi. And uh, <laughs> tell Scott. Tell, tell Scott. Scott until, yeah, Scott will tell David hi. Scott will tell David <laughs> Tell Scott I owe him the face to face the largest um, uh, apology ever, and uh, I'll get him out on the tennis court and let him beat me. So maybe he'll be like, "Oh, this game isn't so bad. I'll hang out with Marianne, play this tennis game." <laughs> but anyway, total pleasure. I really appreciate you for so many reasons, and uh, we will do this again very, very soon. I'd love that. Thanks so much.